Black Golf History is visited once per year in February. However, we have a very rich history in this game. In the next few slides, we'll give you the highlights, but we hope you'll take some time on your own to do more research. The first notable African-American golfer we'll tell you about is John Matthew Shippen. John was an African-American and Native American golfer who worked as a caddy at Shinnecock Hills, which is one of America's very first golf clubs. Growing up working on a golf course gave John access to some of the game's pros, and he learned the game early. In 1896, he played in the second U.S. Open and finished in sixth place, the first African American to do so. However, he was only allowed to play because he registered as Native American and not black. In 1899, a dentist by the name of George Grant contributed to the evolution of the game by inventing a version of the modern wooden golf tee we still use today. Prior to the golf tee, however, golfers carried around buckets of sand to build a mound for the golf ball. Sadly, Dr. Grant never received a dime for his patent. In 1921, the Progressive Realty Company purchased what became known as Shady Rest Country Club, the country's first African-American owned and operated country club and home course to John Shippen. Remember, we told you about him a few slides back. Shady Rest was marketed as a place where respectable men and women can come and enjoy the real and outdoor life and indulge in wholesome, healthful sports such as golf, tennis, croquet, horseback riding, and shooting. The club attracted the social and athletic elite like Althea Gibson, Duke Ellington, and Ella Fitzgerald, to name a few. One of my favorite stories is the William Bill Powell story. When other veterans were using their GI Bills to purchase homes for their families, Bill decided he wanted to build a golf course where everyone could enjoy the game he had grown to love so much. With the help of his wife and his children, he carved nine holes out of farmland in East Canton, Ohio, all while working nights as a security guard. Bill opened Clearview in 1948 and expanded it to 18 holes in 1978. Currently, Clearview is run by his son Larry and his daughter Renee. In the next clip, you'll see a very bad video, but it's an impromptu video. We had a lot of fun running into Renee at the PGA Merchandise Show down in Orlando. Hey Periscope, this is Tiffany Fitzgerald live from the PGA Merchandise Show in Orlando, Florida. And you guys will never guess who is standing here with me. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? So it's golf royalty, golf legend, the second, only the second African-American woman to play on the LPGA Tour. And side note, the LPGA was founded in 1950. We're in 2016 now. We've only had seven, and really a six and a half, because the seventh one, Ginger Howard, is on provisional status. And I'll explain to you guys what that is in another Periscope, because it's kind of technical. But I'm excited, and I want you guys to meet the golf legend. I'm going to turn the camera around so you guys can meet her. Somebody said hi, royalty. It is the Renee Powell. <laughs> hey, Tiffany. How are you? It's great to be here. It's great to be here. So, <laughs> future golf royalty. And you've been doing a great job. Thank you so much. Really? Growing this so game. Much. And, girls and golf. do you know, I do a session in my classroom, session on black golf history. Uh -huh. And of course, you are there. Your father is there. Clearview is there. And I tell people, wow. if you're feeling generous and you would like to donate, to the Clearview Foundation. Absolutely. Here is the information. Oh, great. So, Clearview, because this is another piece of history you guys need to know. William Bill Powell, Renee's father, he hand seeded a golf course with his back, his hands. His hands. So if you hear people tell you they can't or they won't or they don't have the resources or they don't have the will or the motivation to do it, I advise you to, to tell them Bill Powell's story. And you know, Tiffany, that was 70 years ago this year. 70 years 70, ago. 70, 1946. So he birthed, he gave birth to Clearview 70 years ago. And just for a black man at that time, 1946, to have the foresight to say, I don't want to use my GI Bill money to go buy a house or get an education. I want to build a golf course. Think about the foresight. Think, just, just take a few minutes and think about what it took for him to make that happen. And then... We got this, so he gave birth to two yeah. very wonderful things, the golf course and the Renee but, but let me tell you something else, Tiffany. Um, he could not even get a GI Bill because they told him when he came back from World War II that there, were, there was no such thing as a GI Bill. So as a black man came, coming from the war, 
GI bills were not available. But, so he, but tell, he still, them, tell them how he got it done. So what he did was that he taught two black doctors how to play the game of golf. What he then did was, was they each put in a third, purchased a, a piece of land, of which became the original nine holes for Clearview Golf Course, and he literally, by hand, built the golf course. It began in 1946. You hear that? So the next time you hear a black man tell you he can't do something, please tell him this story. So now you've had an opportunity to meet Renee, who was also Clearview's head golf pro. And as I mentioned in the video, she is the second African-American woman to ever play on the LPGA Tour. That's me with Renee and three of the other four living African-American women who have ever played on the LPGA Tour. This picture was taken at Clearview Golf Club at an annual fundraiser Renee hosts every year. 1961 was a pivotal time for golf in the United States. Up until then, the PGA had a Caucasian only clause in its bylaws. The Caucasian only clause was removed after the PGA was threatened with a lawsuit. This also marks the year when the first African American golfer was allowed to play in a PGA co sponsored event in the South. His name was Charlie Sifford, and the event was the Greater Greensboro Open. In 2014, the year before his death, Dr. Sifford was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and he was posthumously inducted into the PGA Hall of Fame in 2015. You probably remember Althea Gibson from her tennis prowess. However, she was an equally talented golfer. In 1963, she became the very first African-American woman to play on the LPGA Tour. Between 1963 and 1986, the landscape of golf began to change, including HBCUs getting their own collegiate golf tournament called the PGA Minority Collegiate Golf Championship. This was necessary because HBCUs were regularly denied the opportunity to compete in NCAA sanctioned events. This is a photo of the Bethune-Cookman women's golf team. They've won three consecutive PGA Minority Collegiate Golf Championships. Notice anything weird about this photo? It's actually not weird at all. Many of our HBCUs have very few African Americans on their teams. In 1996, 10 years after the PGA Minority Collegiate Golf Classic was created, a young phenomenal golfer arrives and changes the game entirely. His name is Tiger Woods. At the age of 20, Tiger Woods turned pro and turned golf upside down. In 2001, Tiger became the youngest golfer to achieve the career Grand Slam. The next African-American male golfer doesn't go pro until 2011. Joseph Bramlett's professional career was very short-lived as he lost his playing privileges just one year later. The bastion of U.S. golf is Augusta National. That's where the Masters is played every year. Augusta National is rich in golf history and tradition that is revered by golf enthusiasts. However, the greens and competitions that bring golfers so much joy has also been the source of pain and humiliation for African American golfers. But in 2013, the club breaks tradition and invites its first woman, Condoleezza Rice. That's me and Condi in Pebble Beach in 2015 for the AT&T Pebble Beach National Pro-Am. In 2015, a few more African-American women make golf history by becoming only the fifth and sixth African-American women to play on the LPGA Tour. Ginger Howard became the seventh in 2016 by earning provisional status in Q School. But the future of golf for African-American women looks pretty bright with Sedina Parks, Cheyenne Woods, Ginger Howard, and promising Stanford standout Mariah Stackhouse. Mariah was the first African-American woman to play on the Curtis Cup team. We're pretty excited about what's next for most stack birdies. That's how you can find Mariah on social media. And nearly 20 years after Tiger won the Masters, Harold Varner III makes his debut on the PGA Tour. We've shared a few of the highlights of African-American contributions to the game, but there are so many more stories to tell, like the ones mentioned in Uneven Lies by Pete McDaniel. We hope you'll take some time to do some more research on your own.